If you will rise, uh, Reverend Bill Randall from St. Simon Baptist Church will give the invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Testing? That's better. Uh, sounds much better. Thank you so much uh, to our, our chairman and to the school board. Uh, let us pray, if you would. Uh, our Father and our God, we are so wonderfully blessed and thankful for this opportunity to come before you again to take care of your business and to do your work and your will as a body that is organized and prepared to do the work for your children. Uh, let us humble ourselves as we possibly can and to seek your divine grace in lifting our voices and lifting our abilities to do your work to bless your children and to bless this community of Clay County. We ask your blessings upon each and every elected official and every administrator. We ask your blessings upon the staff, the beginning of the first of the year, the first day of school, the, the first month of the year. And we pray, O oh God, that you would just honor us and bless us with your divine wisdom, guidance, and direction with leadership. We pray now for every child that rides the bus. We pray for every child that is delivered by the parent. We pray for every staff member from the janitorial staff to the board members. We pray and ask your blessings upon each and every one in the community whereby we understand and we know that it takes a complete village to raise and educate a child with wisdom and in knowledge. And we pray, oh God, and we take you at your word when you say to us that we are to train up a child in the way that they should go and when they're old they will not depart from it and we thank you for that command and we pray for the willingness that everybody will be able to do the work that you've ordered us to do and we do it in the name of all of those who believe and we ask every believer who are present tonight to give it a solid amen if they are a true believer and we say it amen amen god bless you let us prepare for the uh, pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation unto God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Randall. I'd like to call the meeting to order of the Clay County School Board, January 4th, 2018. Welcome citizens of Clay County. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend tonight's school board meeting. This meeting is our opportunity as your elected representatives to collaborate openly and make decisions that will decide the future direction of our public schools and the education of our children here in Clay County. If you wish to address the board, there will be an opportunity to speak for three minutes. Please fill out a card, which you will find located in the back of the room, indicating the specific item, number, or topic you wish to speak about, and turn it in promptly. No additional cards will be accepted once the board moves to the public comment section under presentations from the audience. Your participation is welcomed and appreciated. Uh, I would like for you to uh, notice the new artwork on display on our walls from Dr. Zinlet Elementary School. Nicole Pistorius is the art teacher, so if you have an opportunity, be sure and observe the artwork. Um, our showcase tonight is from Fleming Allen Elementary Drama Club. Phyllis Hill is their sponsor, and uh, they are going to perform a, a part of Peter Pan, I understand. So if y'all want to come up, and after it's over, they want a picture of the entire board with the actors, okay? And if y'all want to go sit down, there's some seats reserved.
Miss Hale, sometime I might want need to borrow that hook. <laughs> you know, in case in case the superintendent gets out of line, I can. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's why we have resource officers. <laughs> Y'all did a great job. Thank you so much, and we'll certainly try to come. Oh, that's a good way to start the year. Yeah. Peter Pan's one of my favorite. Okay. okay, let's see. Recognitions and awards, we have none. Presenters, we have none. School Showcase, Bannerman Learning Center, Mike Elia, Principal. Mr. Elia, you're on deck. I've, I've been coming to these for about four years now, and I understand how hard it is to follow after the students go, so <laughs> I'll do my best. They did a great job. Good evening, Mr. Superintendent, Board Chair, Board Members. I got it right that time. <laughs> um, Happy New Year. And what I'd like to do is start the presentation. I've got about a third of my faculty here tonight, so I do want to recognize them. I think that's important. I've got Mr. Johnson, Ms. Carey. Ms. Solis, Ms. Flack, Dr. Shively, and Ms. Urbano are all here. So, <laughs> faculty is very important to us at Bannerman. What we do there can't be done without the people that work there. It's next to impossible. Also, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Martin Aftuck, my assistant principal. Um, most of you know that I also perform the duties of district hearing officer during the day, so a lot of it falls on his shoulders when I'm in meetings and different things. I'd like to start by talking about how Bannerman works. Um, first thing that occurs at Bannerman, no matter how you come to the school, you're, you go through a hearing process or a formalized IEP. And in that process, we try to create what I call the transformation. The student needs to learn to own the behavior and move from there. At the end of that meeting, we're already moving into the inspiration point. Therefore, the transform, inspire, and that process starts with a formalized plan. We're very fortunate that our numbers allow us to just about individualize every student's curriculum as well as everything that goes on with them as far as social, emotional, behavioral um, needs um, every day that is focused on. So we transform them during the hearing, inspire. Obviously, the main goal of what we do is educate, and the ultimate goal is to return them. As of December 15th this year, we've had 212 students, and that is a mix of students. They're all whether they're there for strictly discipline 
or special education services. We hit 212, that's the highest number since I've been there five years that we've hit at Christmas. And we felt it, they felt it. Um, we serve sixth through 12th grade. We have a daycare and the daycare students, those are actually counted as students for us. They start at six weeks to three years old and then they transition into a different program. Um, 43% of our students are minorities, 75.1% are econ economically disadvantaged, which allows us to provide a lot of services on that individualized level that they don't, they would be overlooked at a larger school with 2,400 or 1,800 students. Um, talking about a diverse population, we serve students from Keystone, Oak Leaf, Middleburg, Orange Park, I hate to say it, Argyle, wherever. Pretty much Northeast Florida, we service those students. We are the melting pot of the county, but what's amazing to me, as long as I've been there, the students all, when they're there, they're Bannerman students. We don't have, oh, well, you beat us at football and different things like that. It's, we're Bannerman, we're in it together, and they move towards working and helping each other. A lot of celebrations over the past few years, and a lot of that has to do, again, I'm going to put it, my staff, teachers, Mr. Aftuck, the support personnel, school social workers, therapists, different people. We don't get a normal school grade like most schools, A, B, C. We have a school improvement rating. Uh, this past year, we went into the maintaining part, which allowed our faculty to utilize, they received funding from the state, and as far as I know, that's the first time that's ever occurred at the alternative school. We increased from 34 to 87 points from 15 to 16, 16 to 17. We've had a 21% increase in students passing the FSA, ELA retake in 2017. I know our numbers are small, but it's still the highest gains in Clay County. And in principals meetings, I let them know. Everybody <laughs> has that understanding. Um, we've had an 8% increase in students passing Algebra 1 retake in 2017. Again, highest gains in Clay County. And I do want to point out, I believe this year we're 100% on the PERT test. And that, again, goes to Ms. Flagg. Her hard work and the ability to be flexible in, in our school setting. At Christmas, we returned 35 students to their home school, and that's after successful completion. Um, most students that attend Bannerman have what we call a review process, and that's based on the assistant principal, the behavior resource teacher, multiple behavior resource teacher input, guidance, and the teachers. The teachers give us input on how that student's performing and whether they meet the review criteria. Um, we have helped 24 seniors graduate from Bannerman in 2017. And if you haven't seen or participated in our graduation ceremony, which I know most of you have, it is very personal. There's testimonials, um, the students, or an active part of that graduation. They manage it, they run it, and when you're sitting there 12 months earlier or nine months earlier and a parent doesn't know what to do or if their kid's gonna actually make it, there, there are quite a few tears that are shed at that, that graduation. The programs at Bannerman, it's real simple. We have the tier program. There's about 10 different ways that you can come to Bannerman under the tier program, whether it's juvenile justice, um, discipline, learning center placement, parent request, uh, just a multitude of ways. You have to remember though, everybody that comes there goes through a hearing. So they're cleared, they're looked at, if there's interventions that can be provided at their home school, we work towards with the administration staff at that home school to send them back and not even take them at Bannerman. We're running probably about 20%, I would say, that come to the table to come in under the tier program 
do re don't even attend Bannerman. We develop different interventions for them at the table. The success program is a little bit different. You can come under discipline, but that's mainly an IEP driven program. A lot of people don't realize Bannerman really is two schools in one. One starts at 10 minutes to 6 and one starts at 7.40 or 10 minutes to 7, I'm sorry. The um, success program is made with autistic spectrum students, intellectually challenged students, and emotional behavioral disorder students. Um, it's very specialized. It's the most intensive program in the county. So we deal with the highest incident students during that time. The TAP program is for our teen parents. They're infused in our day, just like any other student. They abide by the same rules. The big difference is, is there's additional counseling services. Um, and we work. The important component, a lot of people don't realize, when a student has to go out on maternity leave, it's a six-week process. And the amount of paperwork that has to occur prior to them going out is really the main, a lot of what we work with them on. And then when they get back, um, working with the daycare. Um, the daycare, as you can see in the bottom corner there, um, if anybody that comes to Bannerman knows that I show that program off, I would put it against any program in the county. Uh, the teen parents do work in there as much as we can get them in there and that their schedules will allow. Um, but that daycare program, especially dealing with, we're dealing with infants, you know, six weeks old. So it is a very good program for us. Um, mainstay for outside resources and um, everybody, I want to volunteer, I want to volunteer. We use the University of Florida Master Gardeners. That has been the most consistent program. It was there when I was a teacher at Bannerman in 99. It is still running strong today. Actually, it's actually a lot stronger today than it, it was years ago. Um, those volunteers are consistently there on Thursday. Um, this year, we have received some Aetna money for, um, through the University of Florida Extension Office. And we've done a lot of different things that have allowed that to occur. Um, what we noticed, and this is in conjunction with the master gardeners, that the production wasn't true in the garden. The kids were spending more time pulling weeds and different things like that. The master gardeners took the initiative and we went and got barrels from Pepsi. So now, our we, last year we grew 645 pounds of vegetables that went directly to the students um, or used in our culinary program. We over the summer we actually had kids come up and were picking vegetables during the summer just because they knew they were there. Uh, through the grant money we're moving into hydroponics so now the kids are getting more of an edge with the science and technology of um, what goes on in a garden. Um, the greenhouse, the lady that's been doing that, I think, has been there for about 15 to 20 years. These plants that are grown in the greenhouse go to the fair. Last year, the students were, or the students received on an individual basis, the total was $378 from the fair. So, again, we're doing things, everything we do revolves around how do we help that student, how do we engage that student. Um, a lot of students may not like the classroom, may not work all day in the classroom, but when it comes to that garden time and being with Miss Glenn or whoever, they, they work harder than you've seen all day. So it, it's important in a roundabout way. Um, there's also, an, we have a full ecosystem with a pond and natural area. Again, um, this was from the day when we received the grant money uh, to start the hydroponics. One other thing that we do pretty well at Bannerman is we have the CTE program, just like any other school, full CTE programs. We have carpentry, 
Um, we have culinary arts and, of course, the early childhood. One of the other components that we do is CBVE, which is more used for our success side students. And that program gets, I would say, we're probably 90% of the students in special ed that have CBVE on their IEP, they're actually actively engaged in the community in a specific job. The other 10% are working their way to move off campus for a couple hours a day. Um, this is some of the things that we do participate, like any other school in the county. This is the Career Field Day Expo. Um, obviously, you can see our kids, they talk about this. And what happens is year after year, when these guys come back, the kids the next year are looking forward to attending the um, career day. And they go and work on all the machinery and different things and experience different things. Um, this is our culinary program. Uh, this young lady has gone, come a long way. Um, we really don't talk too much outside about specific students, but through the CTE program and the CTE experience, um, she's not only improved in culinary, but she's worked extremely hard as far as her school and academics. And I would put a, anything that we do against any other school in the county. As you can see, this is the service that was provided for um, the ag when we received the money from Aetna. The big thing, and I've been leery because this is this is a um, this is a personal thing that my staff or the staff does. We have an annual Christmas party, and this is done a hundred percent by the faculty and staff at Bannerman to give to the kids to ensure that every kid on that campus, every baby, has some type of good meal during the holidays. Um, we were doing, they were doing two of them a year, one at Thanksgiving and one at Christmas, but we went to desserts at Thanksgiving and now we focus and make this, the whole school gets a, a meal and it's done by the faculty and staff at the school. Um, and of course, any type of holiday party would, would not be without Santa. Um, obviously, he spends a lot of time in the daycare, and that is a real beard, Miss Starr. I don't know if you can see it. I'm trying to figure out who that is. <laughs> I'm sure you know him. I'll let you know. This is, again, some slides of that. And the kids at my school, they've worked hard to this point, and most of them have had their reviews. They know what they've done and, and what's going on. So we do have experience. To me, the social aspect has to happen when it's drill and practice every day, you know, straight through. Um, again, I can't thank the faculty and staff at Bannerman enough. It, they make that school. The teachers, the assistants, I have 74 total employees, 24 as teachers. So I do have a lot of support personnel. Without them, Bannerman wouldn't be where we're at today. Um, and of course, I would be amiss if I didn't thank the business partners. University of Florida Agricultural Extension has been wonderful to us. Um, we picked up the fresh market this year. They've helped a lot with different things. Another Blooming Nursery, Tree Tech. Um, it sounds minimal, but a lot of those people do a lot for us and it's consistent and that's what we teach the kids is consistency is key so are there any questions I have to say this I'm sorry to the chair um, you know Mr. Ilya Mr. Aftuck what you do at your school is outstanding I've I've seen many alternative schools uh, through throughout the uh, northeast part of Florida and south Florida as well 
you are so unique about the services you provide from from cradle to potentially all the way up to 21 22 years of age so hats off for what you do and and you talk about how you transform you inspire and you return you do more than that you educate you nurture and you rebuild and you give kids a sense of hope and that's because of you and the staff that you have and your staff and your stability in your staff they care about you they care about kids and we thank you for what you do every single day and your faculty for your faculty to be here at 39 degree weather it says a lot about about <laughs> your leadership and about their partnership with you in this work so thank you I, I want to add to that thanks from the board because you have a phenomenal school and um, everybody should go to at least one Bannerman graduation and the, the lives that you have turned around and changed and got on the right road I mean we can never thank you enough for all that you do and you teachers. At the graduation, they're always giving the, you know, roses to parents or whatever. But then there's a lot of teachers that get those roses. They, y'all are making an impact on these students' lives, and thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're to schedule citizens' requests. Liz Crane. Oh, if, if, excuse me, Liz, if, if you Bannerman uh, teachers want to leave, I'll give you a couple minutes. I know that y'all are just dying to stay. Run. <laughs> Bundle up. <laughs> I thought I'd give them a break, Liz. <laughs> Anybody else? You, this is your chance. <laughs> okay. Okay, Liz. Did you, you want to ask the board? Excuse me? Did you want to ask the board? Um, just go ahead. Did you say you've got some copies for yes. us? You can yes. give one to each of the board members because we may not be able to see that screen. Yes. I, mean, I don't know about y'all, but it's getting smaller by the day. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is good. Thank you. Liz Crane, you have my address on file. First, let me be clear that I'm not speaking today representing any organization or as a member of the insurance committee. I am going to share with you some information from my experiences as the former CCA president from 08 to 11 and my experiences on the committee. Since 2008, we have gone through several RFPs or requests for proposals for insurance. What I have learned is that we follow a cyclical pattern. Year one, we will have a new insurance carrier or plan with a moderate rates for that year. Then we get the renewal and there's a slight increase and we accept that increase. The next year, we get another renewal and the increase is higher. We ask that carrier to sharpen their pencils and we look at plan design changes. And then we accept the adjusted increase. The next year, the increase is higher again and then we discuss what to do next. Usually that discussion ends in a vote to go out to bid. I was on the committee when we recommended to change, to change carriers in 2013-14 to Florida Blue. After we voted to change carriers to Florida Blue, I remember Dr. Copeland saying something interesting. He was not happy with the vote. He said that the real loser in the vote was Florida Blue. I didn't understand his comment then, but I do now. We went out to bid very quickly after that in 2016-17. Florida Blue's proposal still included an increase and they lost the account. Dr. Copeland was right, Florida Blue lost. Since 2014-15, we are seeing an upward tick in total claims. So, so, make sure I do this right. So, so here are your claims right here. That's where you have the upward tick. The claims in 2015-16 went from approximately $19.5 million to approximately $23.6 million rolling 2016-17. As you can see, the plan is running high with a loss ratio, that's right here, of 104.3%. This means that United is losing money on us. This means that the total premiums paid to United is less than the claims being paid out. Oh, good, I did it right. 
The next report that I saw included our claims experience from month to month, and again, we're running high. So it's, sorry, it's a little faded out there. Hold on. So from February, it's 108.2, going all the way down to 140.1%. Okay, and it's normal during the summer months for those to run high because that's when employees are not working and then they're going to their doctors during that time. However, I'm noticing that our loss ratio was over 100% from February forward. So looking at your report right here. So why is that? Are more people using the plan or do we have some sick members on the plan? Then I learned that we do have some very sick members on the plan. A report detailing that from October 2016 to 2017, we see that there are 25 member claims, and that's coming to 4 .6, over $4.6 million. Looking historically, we're looking at a huge increase in high claimants. The list of diagnoses are not managed conditions, as you can see. These conditions are life-threatening. Currently, and note that the numbers here are immature, only 10 months, our loss ratio is 106.3. Again, United is taking a loss on our account. Our utilization report showed something interesting. Our people here are not going to the doctor. There's a decrease. We saw a decrease in utilization of the primary care physician. That decreases 41%. Is this because employees are utilizing the free clinic or because it's more costly for them to go to the doctor and then they don't go. Our current contract, sorry, this is going to be hard to read, but it, you have it. Um, current contract language is specific. The committee makes recommendations to the board and the CCA in regards to matters regarding insurance. And you can find that right there. The recommendations are regarding bids, specifications, recommend to RFP, bid tabulations, and monthly experience rating reports. We don't own the plan itself. The plan is owned by the board. One year, we made a recommendation to the board regarding plan design changes, and the board rejected the recommendation and went a different route. When the CCA and the board entered the flat dollar amount of $258.49 in the contract as opposed to the board contributing 100%, this was strategic because we knew that the board could change the plan design in order to pay for the, insur for the insurance. So basically, if the contract read that the board agrees to pay 100% of the single employee coverage the ca and the carrier proposes a high renewal rate, the board could in turn water down the plan so that they could cover that single employee premium increase. I have heard a lot of discussion about becoming self-insured. The committee looked at this a number of years ago, and we found that it would be too expensive to do. As you know, if the school board were to be self-insured, we would be paying the claims, that we, and we would also have to be able to design that plan the way we wanted to without the confines of the carrier. That is a plus. But remember, we would be paying the claims. So that four point, come back here. This 4.6 million dollars would be on the school board to pay on top of all the typical plan uh, claims that one would see in a plan year. So does the board have money to do this? Florida Statute 112.08 details what is required for us to become self-insured. One of those compliances is to be solvent. The board would have to have in reserves in addition to the IBNR or incurred but not reported claims to ensure solvency of the plan. Do we have a reserve like that now? When the committee looked at this a few years ago, it was the understanding that these reserves could not be rolling. A few years ago, I heard about a medical claim that was being denied by one of the aforementioned carriers. The situation was the member to leave the state of Florida to have a procedure done in another state outside the plan. The procedure was life-saving. Our insurance department had to fight with the carrier to get the claim approved, and it was approved. However, if we were self-insured, who would that member turn to? In researching, I found some contract language in Alachua County. They have a self-insured plan. As a side note, they also have $45 million in their unreserved fund at about 15%. Alachua County also has a 1.0 mil levy voter approved for four years specifically to pay for music, art, library, guidance, chorus programs, classroom technology, and school nurses. This was based on their 1718 tentative budget that I found on their website. 
Per their teacher contract language, the administration would be responsible for investigating claims problems experienced by the employee. If the problem is not resolved, then the employee could ask for the assistance of their insurance committee, a committee that's similar to what we have. Does the board want an in-house committee to review the claims? How would that work exactly? If we had an outside claim review committee, how would that work? The committee would, have, would be having to agree or not agree to spend board money, money that the board may or may not have. Since our loss ratio is over 100%, I do expect to see a hefty renewal rate increase from United. This makes sense. United is not a charity. They're a company. The result of selling insurance is to make money. So how do we address this problem? At the bargaining table, the CCA rescinded their insurance proposal of increasing the board insurance contribution rate from $258.49 to $300, or by $41.51. The final result of this action was a status quo tentative agreement by both parties. I can only assume at this point that the agreement was due to lack of funds. So assuming that the United does propose a hefty renewal increase, we have some options such as plan design changes, spousal surcharge, and tobacco use charges, etc. A spousal charge is when a spouse is on our plan even though the empl their employer provides a plan. We would add a charge to them so that they would, they would be on our plan as opposed to their employer's plan. A tobacco usage charge would mean that if you smoked, you would pay a higher premium. I don't know what the percentage of employees that smoke, so it might be a cost savings and it might not be, depends on how many. So if you want to lower your premium, there's an, also an idea called house plan house rules, and we looked at this a few years ago. And what this means is that if you want a lower premium rate, you would need to just demonstrate, meaning you the employee, a healthy lifestyle, such as lower body mass index, BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol count, sugar levels, etc. At the time, I did ask several employees what they thought of it, and they really didn't like the idea of lifestyle determining a premium charge. Perhaps they would be more inclined to agree to this type of plan now. So as you can see, we can make some changes, but those changes are small. They might not be enough to offset any increases from the carrier we see down the line. The insurance committee will be meeting on January 16th at 4 o'clock, and the meetings are public and anyone may attend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crane. Um, this is the last call for the comment cards. If anyone wants to turn in a card, now is your chance. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, <clears throat> Presentations from the audience. Uh, the first speaker. The first speaker is um, Scott Norderman. Hi, my name is Scott Norderman. Um, I live at. Uh, 1447 uh, Greenway Place here on Fleming Island. Um, I'm coming up, up here to uh, comment on an issue that was brought up uh, during the, the last school board meeting a month ago um, related to uh, charter student access to, to district activities. Um, just a quick reminder about exactly what was discussed there. There was a new, uh, a new policy was issued by the superintendent uh, which results in um, charter students being excluded from some specific district activities. Um, when we when we discussed that, there was uh, there was quite a bit of, of discussion and, and back and forth. A number of parents came up, uh, obviously, to respond to that. Um, the, I think the the way we left it, though, or, or further discussion that took place between the board and the superintendent was that there would be uh, information provided, uh, I think specifically the meeting minutes um, were being requested. Um, I think Mr. Daggett was going to uh, do some research and uh, get some opinions uh, about the legal aspects of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I think the issue was, was pushed forward. Um, I really kind of thought about this a lot over the uh, over the course of the course of the holiday and in the past month, and 
you know, I know that, you know, that we discussed uh, issues, you know, that there was some miscommunication involved, um, that some of those, some of those things that we thought were, um, you know, were to be excluded uh, were, were not. I think the spelling bee was one of them. I, I know that one was, was not correct. Um, although it was on the meeting minutes, uh, we did ultimately get an invite for that. So, uh, Mr. Davis, I do appreciate that, obviously. Um, I think uh, there was a lot of debate about the uh, potential additional costs for, you know, the two additional uh, two charter schools, you know, to, uh, um, to participate in activities uh, with the remaining 41 public schools uh, here in the district. Um, a lot of discussion about the legal minutia. Um, and uh, most of that coming from the, uh, the armchair lawyers uh, standing up here at the podium, including myself, uh, and of course from, from Mr. Daggett as well. Um, I think the, the, uh, the net of this for me is, though, that it's really just one of fairness. Um, you know, what is the, what's the best for all students here? That's, m that's my concern. And that there are still some activities that these students would be uh, excluded from you know, really, uh, really troubles me. So, whatever justification we might come up with to uh, to, to maintain this policy, um, you know, for, for excluding uh, charter students is really uh, is really not something I want to see continue. So, I think the end result is that a tiny percentage of these Clay County public school students get excluded, um, you know, from some district activity. So, I'd renew my request. Um, for the board to uh, put an agenda item on the agenda for, for next time so that we can uh, set this policy and clarify um, you know, a, a, an, an equitable policy for all students in the county. Thank you. The next speaker is Jennifer Berghart. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Burkhardt and my uh, address is on file. Um, I missed the last school board meeting due to my daughter's holiday party at Bronco Building Blocks, so I just want to give a shout out to Bronco Building Blocks. They're amazing. My son also goes to Little Paws at Ridgeview. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, so, well, she's five now. So um, they're great, love it, the school um, associated daycares. So I actually had an entire speech prepared to give about the need for teacher autonomy in the classroom and addressing my concern with the new mandatory standardized curriculum maps for ninth and 10th grade English. Um, so I that all prepared for the last school board meeting. However, a few days before the school board meeting, I received my monthly email update from the union, and in it, there was a line assuring teachers that the curriculum maps were just guides. I had to reread it because the most stress I've been under as a 10th year teacher was due to the new curriculum maps that I was under the impression were mandatory or at least strongly encouraged and that's the way it was presented to myself. So to have a line just like, oh yeah, we're good, their, their curriculum guides was a little bit startling for me. So I'm happy to see that, but I felt it was necessary to be addressed because I know for a fact I'm not the only teacher who was under the impression that they were mandatory. So we have been addressing some very difficult, challenging curriculum um, and perhaps not in the best way. So I even debated even addressing it since obviously the bottom line is that we did get autonomy within the curriculum maps. Um, so I do want to point out, um, I didn't think there was a need to speak regarding this topic since clearly the outcome of um, teachers maintaining autonomy of their classroom has been made evident. However, then I began thinking that there has to be several other teachers that may not realize this. So I know this because after I began speaking at school board meetings in August, um, I started being contacted by previous coworkers who currently teach ninth and 10th grade English, thanking me for speaking up on behalf of us um, English teachers. Therefore, I simply want to make sure that every ninth and 10th grade English teacher realizes that our curriculum maps are not mandatory as, as was portrayed to us. I also want to emphasize and reiterate the importance overall of teacher autonomy in the classroom. At a recent retirement party, I had the opportunity to meet a teacher from Duval County. Our new, um, uh, and we ended up discussing our new um, curriculum maps. Um, so we discussed how our new cur curriculum map, maps, excuse me, assign specific works as opposed to specific standards. And this was brought up, not by myself, but another teacher. And this teacher from Duval County said that we Clay County teachers were quote, spoiled. 
I was somewhat taken aback by this word choice. I do not consider being treated like a professional who is knowledgeable about my content and knows what's best for my students because I've been in the trenches teaching inclusion um, students for going on 10 years as being spoiled. I consider it an expectation of my profession and will accept nothing less than autonomy within my own classroom. I would also like to point out that now my pay is dependent on student performance. To be exact, $7,200 is on the line now. As a result, I firmly believe that I should have freedom within my lesson plans to teach in a manner that I know will allow my students to make gains rather than forcing a square peg in a round hole. So thank you very much for your time. Okay. Uh, that completes our uh, presentations from the audience. <clears throat> Next we'll go to the adoption of the consent agenda. Uh, the only item pulled was C8. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Second. Have a motion by Ms. Kirikas, second by Ms. Bola. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries 5-0. Next is the CCEA update. Uh, I don't believe Renalee's here. Anyone here to speak for Renalee? Okay, CESPA update, Teresa Dixon. I don't see Ms. Dixon either. Anyone here to speak for Ms. Dixon? I guess it's too cold to be out tonight. Okay, uh, now we'll go to the discussion. Oh, wait a minute, superintendent's update and presentations. I almost... <laughs> You were trying to get through quickly. <laughs> hey, put the timer on. Hey, Dr. Lugato, you better put the timer yes, on. Yes, ma'am. She got the timer to get a little buzzer. <laughs> yeah, through the chair. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, CESPA and CEA. They want to tell me they love the superintendent and uh, that, I, that I would handle this tonight. Um, I love you all, too. Thank you so very much for what you do. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ms. Dix and Ms. Ms. Lee tonight instead of Ms. Byla. But uh, every month, uh, I either do a presentation and, uh, or, and identify a champion of change. Uh, I was prepared to do a graduation um, uh, presentation to talk about the, you know, the movement and uh, potential movement uh, within our graduation rates. However, the state has not released it. So, uh, you know, we sit ready to go for next month. Be ready. Uh, on top of that, and along with uh, some data mid-year analytics, we'll go through that. So be prepared. So tonight, uh, I don't have a number of slides, but I do have one champion of change who could not make it in uh, December. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, buzz has been taking place around technology within uh, Clay County over the last couple of months. And, uh, you know, from, from my side coming in, uh, the first conversation I had with Dialogue with Davis, I looked at um, my principals and I said, we're going to go in the next, uh, you know, 60 days, we're going to go one-to-one. -one. We're going to have wireless in every one of our schools because... We didn't have a lot of that. We had some schools, three schools that had a, a tremendous amount of technology and they were concept schools. And then you had the other continuum, the majority of the schools didn't have access to wireless, didn't have the equipment to do a lot of the work. So a lot of the focus um, in, in funding uh, weren't given in order to make it come a uh, reality within our school district. But I will tell you, when I got here, I, I, I met a young man, and uh, this young man told me, hey, I'm always going to be up front with you the day you don't want me here, I'm, and, and my plan's not working, let me know, we'll part ways as friends. And I've always respected this individual because he's always transparent with me, always up front with me, and tells me where I stand, uh, you know, whether it's good or bad. He allows me to grow professionally. But nonetheless, what he's done in the last uh, couple months in Clay County, the year I've been here, has been outstanding. Putting more than uh, 20,000 Chromebooks in the hands of students, bringing on a team that had, and a plan that has conversions for new phone systems, uh, new wireless in all of our classrooms, accessibility for our teachers, and has a staff that helps and drives the instructional part of it. It's been unreal. So, in the last year, I can tell you this individual has been a uh, blessing to me, a blessing to the school district, where we now can really catch up with other school districts around the state and nation. And my champion change this month is Mr. Jeremy Bunkley, who is director. Director of IT, you please come up. It's getting cold in here. I can't thank you enough for what you do for the school district. Uh, with me, without me, you do right by kids, and uh, I thank you, sir. Got to take a picture, sorry. 
Hey, Jeremy, 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 take your coat off. They'll think we don't have the air on. I mean the heat. Y'all, it's getting cold in here, by the way. I'm just, I just want you, you know, come on. It's freezing in here. That picture will be so much better now, Jeremy. Congratulations. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you for him and IT, what they do. The other thing before I go back and, and transition this over to, the, to our board chair, I have to say the work that uh, Michael Kemp, his shop with Phil Hans has, have done over the last day in transportation as well with, uh, with Daryl Sweat and uh, along with, um, uh, with Tommy Fitzpatrick as well is, is really working to get our classrooms and our, and our transportation up and running due to the cold weather. So many thanks to each of you. I know you're working countless hours to, to make this happen for, for our classrooms, to accept our faculty, staff, and students. And thank you for the last couple of days for making it happen. It's been a unique year, to say the least. And then when we have Irma, now we have a cold, you know, potential snow. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of things going crazy. But nonetheless, thank you for what you've done, and thank you for making it happen. All right. That was... That was a world record time. I, he'll he'll make up for it next month. I tell you. Just do the chair. Next just, month you can hang out. Is it just me or is it cold in here? It is cold. My chair. hands are cold. Through the chair portables first. Classroom second. <laughs> I guess we're way down. Way, way down. Okay. Uh, discussion item D1, controlled open enrollment plan for 2018. Excuse me? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. Have a motion by Ms. Uh, Condon and a second by Ms. Kirikas. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Here we go. It's slow because it's cold. Okay. Human Resources Special Action A. I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Yeah. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Condon, a second by uh, Ms. Bola. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries 5-0. There, uh, let's see, C8, permission to publish an advertisement for K-12 science textbook adoption. This item was pulled by Ms. Gilhausen, uh, so I will turn this over to you, Ms. Gilhausen. Well, you need a motion. Wait, let a me second. get a motion and a second first. Okay. I move approval. Okay. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, so now let's open it up for discussion. Ms. Gilhausen, since this was your item, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Studdard. Um, bear with me. I wrote down what I wanted to say, okay. so I'm going to read a little bit. Um, okay. But first, I want to um, just express my appreciation for Dr. Stallman and her team. Um, I know that this was quite the undertaking from reading the process that um, took place in this textbook adoption. It was very thorough um, and inclusive of our teachers and community stakeholders, and I appreciate that. Um, and I also understand that textbooks are a resource in our classrooms. They're not the meat and potatoes of it. And um, that leads me into my concern. Um, the guidelines and the standards that are given to us by the state, um, I know kind of tie our hands because obviously we want our kids to do well on the exam. So those standards and benchmarks are important that our kids meet those um, items and are exposed to that information in order for um, them to do well on those exams. But my difficulty um, lies in the narrow scope, 
as it relates to the theory of human and species origin, in that the only theory mentioned is evolution, and all that is expected for students to know is its supporting evidence and none of its flaws. At best, this limited level of exposure for students to the highly contested views on the origin of life and species is negligent. At the worst, it's intellectually deceptive. While evolution is indeed the most widely accepted theory among the majority of scientists, it's not now nor has it ever been accepted by the majority of Americans. Gallup cited in a poll done in 2017 that roughly two-thirds of Americans do not hold to the theory of evolution in its strictest sense. Our students are a part of our society, and we're shortchanging them by failing to provide a full and complete science education that will allow them to have all of the evidence, facts, and opinions in order that they may grow to be critical thinkers and lifelong learners who make well-informed decisions about the world around them. What I would like to see at the district level is that we set additional benchmarks and curriculum guides that go above and beyond what the state is requiring. By explicitly stating that each theory we teach is taught in its entirety, presenting both supporting evidence as well as the gaps and flaws. Origin of life and species is far from a settled science, and we shortchange our students when we teach it as though it were. Ask them to think critically and examine each theory. Allow room for discussion, giving rise to a more inclusive classroom setting, where ideas are th thoroughly explored and discussed. When we ask students to master both sides of an issue, it fosters a higher level of learning and a more rigorous education. This applies to theories on the age of the earth and climate change as well. In many of the current benchmarks, those things are mentioned as though they were settled science instead of highly contested and debated issues that they are. My other concern, um, and it's less of a concern, but the fifth grade science textbooks will now include the reproductive system, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, so long as, first of all, um, parents are notified prior to the material being covered. And since it's in the textbook, and it hasn't ever been before, I think it would be prudent, prudent to notify the, the parents as well at the beginning of the school year. Um, and then the other caveat, I believe that we need to adhere to is that the material is not covered in a co-ed setting. A child's natural inhibitions should be protected, and when we have discussions on such sensitive information in a co-ed setting at a young age, it begins to break down those natural barriers which serve to protect our kids from early sexual activity. If our goal is to foster an abstinence expectation, it starts by protecting their inhibitions. So um, my request is that we look at what we are um, including in our curriculum guidelines. It's not so much about the textbooks themselves, um, but I would like to see those changes before we adopt a textbook. Okay, Mr. Mr. Davis, would you like to address this? Yeah, through the chair, and um, Ms. Ms. Gilhausen said it well in the sense that the, the state st uh, identifies the standards. And uh, for every parent out there, you know, in, in a point where they believe that there's any content that could be contentious to them and their family, they have the opportunity to opt out of that content. And uh, we will always provide an alternative, um, uh, alternative assignment to, the, to, to our parents if, if there's definitely a need. As it relates to us looking at um, uh, additional adding information to our guides, we definitely as a team can look and determine whether or not uh, the guides need to be adjusted in any way. And then we will look at um, what types of notifications we send out to parents. Well, um, I have a list of the specific benchmarks and standards that are set forth by the state and I don't have a problem I don't think we need to alter or remove those my my question I guess is before we move forward on this can we add um, more specific guidelines about um, studying all of scientific theory on human origin and um, origin of species um through my through, through the chair dr. Stallman from from our side looking at this uh, I think this is a the cleanest pro cleanest process we've ever had in reverence since I've been in my leadership through the adoption process, the cleanest procedures and interactions that we've had with with our staff. Uh, 
from what the staff and committee have aligned and selected uh, tonight you're adopting the, uh, you're adopting the text so what you're asking tonight so my recommendation through the chair and through the board that brought through the agenda is to approve the adoption in, of the the publishing permission to publish the advertisement for the k-12 science textbook education as a as a collective if we just decide we need to look at different things to add within within our our curriculum guides then we can talk about that as a as a board I have a question um, that came up. Um, I, I didn't have any um, knowledge of what Ms. Gilhausen was going to bring up, but when this, we got the email that this was pulled for discussion, I went back through and read all the things that I had kind of just glanced over um, when we reviewed this at um, our agenda review in December. I did call Mr. Um, Davis this afternoon and apologize for my late question um, and so I asked him a question this afternoon hopefully that he could be prepared to answer tonight my concern is in our backup for this it says that we which I agree with you we have a better process than we've ever had before but one of my concerns is in there it states that we had community meetings um, community nights on Monday November 6 at Oak Leaf High School Tuesday, November 7th at Keystone Heights, and Monday, November 13th at Fleming Island High School, and um, that it was displayed for all parents and stakeholders to review. So my question for Mr. Davis was, I had no recollection of those parent nights being advertised. I heard nothing about them. I went back, I happen to have a child at Keystone High School, so I went back to the Facebook page. I, I followed their Facebook page. I went back, I saw no advertisement about it. I went back and looked through my email that we all get wondering you know did I miss because it can happen you know we all we get so many emails and I guess so my question for Mr. Davis was how many people non-teachers um, attended these community meetings and gave feedback how did we advertise them because I think we need to be true to our process if we're going to have community meetings which is a good way to um, I think circumvent challenges under the new instructional resources um, statute so I, I think it's a great process but we have to be true to it so I, I asked Mr. Davis that question I don't know if you had any chance to follow yeah. up so through the chair Ms. Condon called me at 455 today and said hey I got some questions and I was like uh you know uh, but then again we the board me yeah I, I, I apologize you. She, she, yeah, she, so um and I apologize and I told you did. no surprises she, on the board floor she did and uh, you know we're gonna get a surprise every <laughs> month now so you know I, I did much homework as I could and and please know that uh, the process doesn't require that we have community meetings these are just us going out to, to do them ourselves so um, if you're asking can we get better with advertising and communicating yes so this isn't part of the adoption cycle or process so us going out and having community meetings at Oakley Keystone and Fleming Island was just to attract more teachers to have availability for the materials to review to um, uh, we had links and flyers that we hit we handed out um, we also uh, messaged this to the weekly briefing through um, to Mr. Connor to the high schools for availability for them to, to come out and make that market throughout their schools. Could we do a better job with um, putting it on marquees and our, our Facebooks? Absolutely. But from this side, this is something we went over. And That's not my question. My question was, we said we had the meetings. So what I want to know have. is how many non, how many, yeah. how much feedback did yeah. we get? Because as the board I don't I didn't find any knowledge that we yeah. knew about them so I want I'd like to know what the yeah, what the and feedback was. So, and, and through the chair, um, you know, I'd say that uh, between 10 and 12 individuals attended the Oak Leaf, to my understanding, less than 10 at both the Keystone and Fleming Island. But, you know, I tell you this, it starts like Starbucks started, one cup at a time. We'll start at one parent at a time. And uh, as it relates to feedback, we got we, zero feedback from a contention for our adoption cycle process. And that was from both parents, students, and teachers as well. Did we advertise those meetings? Um, we did through... We did through the instructional materials website, uh, talked to Supervisor Rokan, who said she published it on her website, and uh, we, we talked about uh, putting it on school websites as well. So again, the question came at 4.55, so I haven't had a chance to get all the information, but uh, I, I am proud that, that our staff went and, and, and did went over and beyond and had some community meetings. As we all can get better in reference to our body of work, we'll continue, if we offer these types of meetings, we'll continue to work forward to, to make sure we advertise everything we do, regardless if it's in policy or not, in order to engage our stakeholders. So um, I'm just going to tell you frankly, for me, 
I could adopt these textbooks with the caveat that we had the guidelines that go with it, because I know that's the expectation is that our teachers will, um, their teaching will reflect um, the guidelines, not necessarily the textbook. So, um, and I, from talking to um, Dr. Stallman, the textbooks are the most aligned to the standards that they've ever been, that that was part of the um, goal for this process. So, I, knowing that and knowing what the standards are, I can't in good conscience support that if we're not going to go the extra measure to ensure that we're giving a fair shake to all theories and not such a one-sided view of science. Okay, Dr. Stallman, let me ask you something. Um, years and years ago, this came up. It, uh, evolution raised its ugly head. And I remember um, a teacher at Ridgeview, David uh, Campbell, I believe was his name, he, he spoke very eloquently that night at the board meeting. And I honestly don't remember how many years ago it was, but it seems to be cycling and coming back. But it's my understanding that we teach a balanced approach, that we are not promoting evolution, we're not promoting anything. We are just presenting a balanced approach of, of this theory, that theory, whatever. Am I wrong? That, that is correct based on the standard. One of the misconceptions is that <clears throat> the theory of evolution is introduced in the seventh grade mm -hmm. as a science standard, and it is coupled with a second standard that teaches students to dis dis discern between theory and fact. Right. And that's how it's been addressed in the past. And, it's, um, and I've, I haven't heard anything about it in years and years and years, and um, I'm... I, I haven't had any complaints over the years from parents, and and I thought if it's different than I thought it was, but my uh, understanding is is that we teach a balanced approach that we're not going to uh, push one thing over another. And then as far as did you start talking about sex ed, or did I yeah, bring that up about getting the girls and the boys separated? Right. Uh, it's about time for that to come up again. Two. This is just a recycle. Uh, every once in a while, somebody just has to bring it up, and so we'll talk about it. But, you know, uh, we're not going to um, destroy the minds of these is, children. I think what she's saying, though, what Dr. Stallman was saying is that it has changed. That now it's introduced earlier. Is that what you were saying? Uh, it, it has always been a seventh grade standard that they introduced the theory of evolution. Um, and it's introduced uh, as a theory uh, of practice. Mm -hmm. And then it's coupled in the instructional process with a second standard that is, is in seventh grade as well, differentiating between theories and facts and how to discern that information. So it's the teacher's responsibility through professional development to make sure that students know that it is a theory and that there is a, there's certain um, information you have to glean from your reading to discern that one is fact and one is, what is fact and what is theory. Um, does it present the other another position? Um, it does not in the Florida standards as Ms. Gilhausen is speaking about. To have us address that in our curriculum would be a process that we would have to spend some time looking at. We'd have to look at research-based positions. How many positions do we present? Do we present the Christian side of it versus another side of it? Um, so it would just take us some time to look at that, um, if that was your pleasure. That, and that's all I'm asking. I'm not, I'm not asking that we don't teach evolution. I'm not asking. Um, it, all I'm asking is that we present every theory it's um, and every theory in its entirety that we discuss the flaws and we discuss the strengths um, and I, I have with me Ms. Stuttered if you want them the standards themselves I wrote down the ones that to me were questionable um, and I mean I can quote them if you like in seventh grade there's one that says explore the scientific theory of evolution by relating how the inability of a species to adapt within a changing environment may contribute to the extinction of that species Another one is explain and give examples of how physical evidence supports scientific theories that the Earth has evolved over geologic time due to natural processes. Explore the scientific theory of evolution by recognizing and explaining ways in which genetic variation and environmental factors contribute to evolution by natural selection and diversity of organisms. Recognize that fossil evidence is consistent with the scientific theory of evolution. I mean, these are very one-sided arguments. Um, 
And I, I don't think we're giving our kids a thorough education if we only expose them to the strengths of one side. So um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. I'm not here to debate one side or the other. I just want, um, I think that debate needs to take place in the classroom. Any other comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Davis, anything else you wanna say? Okay, then you ready for the vote? Oh, well, we, we, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion carries four to one with Ms. Skillhausen dissenting. <clears throat> an internet service error era what in the world hmm yeah, yeah. <laughs> where's mr. Buckley it it's I'm back to where I was but it's this hey the champion of change all right look at here let's see if it does it again it's Coo Coal, that's right. I think it worked that time. I think it worked that time. Okay. It's because he Mr. came Buckley. up here and he made it work. <laughs> he even's got his coat on, y'all. It is cold in here. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, last item discussion of the attendance boundary for Discovery Oaks Elementary School and revisions to area impacted in existing schools request to advertise 21 day notice of public hearing and propose final action adopting option one plan I will entertain a motion I'll move approval I'll second Kyricus uh, made the motion and Condon seconded okay all those in oh any discussion I did go up and take a picture of it during the Christmas holidays. It's it's looking good. I mean, there's walls, and I mean, it's you can tell it's there. It. I got my husband said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm taking a picture. It's right there. It's beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous." Okay. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Motion carries five zero. Yay. Okay, our next item, school board attorney remarks. I have none, ma'am, thank you. Oh, that's the kind we like. School board member remarks, I'll start at the end. Ms. Con um, uh, Gilhausen, I'm um, gonna get the last word tonight. <laughs> She's got a Georgia thing hanging around her neck, no way. So um, I just have a couple of requests. Um, Mr. Nordeman has come to us for two months now, and I think it's important that we um, consider his request that we look at a policy for how we're going to treat um, the interaction of charter school students at our um, uh, district level activities, and which ones specifically, I still am not sure they're being discluded from. Did we ever get an answer on that? Yeah, we got a follow-up email from follow okay. email. We had a follow-up email from I Mr. Davis. Tab. Okay. Um, and then the only other thing is, I guess I need to get with you, Dr. Salman, about um, what we could do curriculum guide-wise as far as um, what we just discussed. Would that be something that you and I would discuss, or how, how would we bring that? Well, we didn't actually discuss making any changes. You suggested it, but the boards was quiet. So right, if this is something you want changed, you need consensus from the board, which you didn't have. Well, but I, th I thought what we voted on tonight was the textbook adoption. We voted to approve the textbook adoption, right. not your changes to guidelines. Okay. We didn't so vote I on changes to guidelines. What, are we, what should we do moving forward? Is that not something that the board has well, announced? It sounds like it's covered already okay. from what Dr. Stallman and Mr. Davis said. I would think if you wanted more change, that that would be through you and the superintendent outside of the board. And then if there's something that needs to be presented to the board, he would bring it to... Right. Okay, it's just, yeah. it's a new process. I don't, I'm yeah. not trying to offend. Yeah. I'm just curious what the process would be. Why don't you uh, with make an appointment Davis. with Mr. Okay. Davis sure. and you, the, then y'all can sit down and work it out, okay? Yeah. Sounds good. Um, anything else? That's all. Ms. Bola. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump on you. 
We're not jumping on people. We're not allowing that. Okay, Ms. Bola. A reminder to teachers, the Clay County Education Foundation grants will be coming out soon, the applications for those. So if you are, if you have something that you would like to purchase for your students, for your classrooms, um, somewhere in the vicinity of $500 or less, make certain that you fill those grant applications out. I also wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Dix and Mr. Anderson for the open houses that we attended in the fall um, at Clay High and Orange Park High School. I am amazed at the wonderful things that we have going on in our schools. And it never ceases to amaze me when we go in and see in the presentation that you gave tonight, Mr. Leah, that we are doing phenomenal things with our students. And when you go in and a young lady comes up and says, and I asked, well, what, what year are you? And she said, I'm a senior. And I said, well, what do you want to do next year? And she said, well, I want to double major in college in astrophysics and music. <laughs> And I just sort of, you know, sort of picked my job real quickly because I didn't want to act too. And I said, that's phenomenal. How nice. And going to the next school and meeting a teacher who teaches physics, has a background in astrophysics. And I thought, we've got to get these, <laughs> these people together. This was awesome. Um, and we're looking forward to two more coming up at Fleming Island and Keystone Heights High School. So this this is the sort of thing that excites me to no end. And I just wanted to say thank you to the students and the faculty and the staff for making um, this such a wonderful job in that respect. Um, a reminder, Mr. Davis, if you would please look at those numbers coming up in the elementary schools. January traditionally is one of those months where we get all sorts of students either changing schools or coming in from other counties. Um, that the numbers are going to be interesting. And if there are those that are on that bubble are going over, my concern is for the resource teachers in the elementary schools. Um, it's one thing to add a fifth grade teacher. It's another to say, well, we've got an average class size of 22 between fourth and sixth grade. But, and our teachers are truly attempting to plan together and they're doing a phenomenal job of it. And with that said, during that resource time, the uh, perhaps five or six teachers are planning together, but the four resource teachers are then handling all of those children. And when you get an art class, upwards of 30 some students, it's not as workable as it might be in, an, in another area. So just, if you would please keep an eye on it um, and help those that need it. And I believe that that's it. Thank you. Happy New Year. Okay. Ms. Caracas? I have two things. Um, Ms. Crane tonight got me thinking again, and I know we've talked about health insurance, and uh, Mr. Dagger, the last month at the meeting, you know, I asked you to look into it, that we need to address it somehow. Um, and I know you're, it's on your mind and a priority for this district. Um, and we did talk about it um, one day last week. I brought it up with you. But she got me thinking that, um, you know, in nine years, this district hasn't contributed anything additional to the $238 per pay period. We've all inherited this mess, every one of us. And so um, I'm going to ask if we could come up with some kind of plans, if you can ask your staff to come up with something that find some things that we can cut because I know the long term what we're looking at whether it be self-insured or whatever is great but that's not helping them on the January 15th paycheck and the February 1st paycheck and February 15th and you know we've got people who you know none of them are making an outrageous amount of money yet the premiums have increased so high that you know we're taking away people's gas money and grocery money and and, and it's not intentional you know it just if, there's lots of companies in the same boat that we're in so you know I, I understand we need to have curriculum and all the things that we're spending a lot of money on we've got to have our Chromebooks and we've got to have every school what you know wireless and and that we need to have but we also have to be able to retain our employees and we're not a district right now that people really want to come to because of our health care coverage and the premiums that they're expected to pay so um, 
I don't have a plan. And like I said, listening to Miss Crane has got me thinking, you know, you guys deal with this all the time. Is there some plans, three different plans, or five different ideas or options that you can come back and say, well, well we can cut this, or we could cut that, and maybe we can contribute you know, $50 more, $100 more, too, and whatever. And I know it's a lot of money. Dr. Legutko has told us that. We don't have the money. I get that. So I'm asking you to pull something out of your magic bag, see what you can find. And then if you can find and come back with some good plans for us, maybe we as a board need to have a workshop and talk about it because we need to talk about this out in the open. I know it was, it was mentioned, you know, in executive session, and then it was, you know, we only talk about the negotiation stuff. So this is a sunshine thing that we need to talk among ourselves. So it, it really pains me to see where we are with our premiums for our employees. And um, we've got to do something about it. We can't just sit here and pass it every month like we've done for six months now which is pretty much what we're doing. We're listening, we're hearing our bus drivers come, and we're not doing anything. So I'm sorry I didn't call you at 5 o'clock. <laughs> and my next one I also didn't call you about, nor did I call Mr. Daggett and Ms. Legutko, Dr. Legutko, and I apologize to both of you, but this was a last-minute thing that I got. Um, and I took a bunch of notes while these people were talking. Contract review. Contract review, um, it seems like there's a problem with the process, and I've heard from several schools that it's taking far too long to process their contracts for things of internal spending at their schools. Um, I've heard from district staff that they're overwhelmed with the number of contracts that are coming across them. Mr. Daggett, this was one of the very first things you told me you were going to address when you started in April, and it's not done. And um, I will tell you that when previous attorney, Mr. Bickner, was here, he handled all the contracts that were uh, dis internal school spending and all the contracts. They went through him, and then they came to the board. Um, it's gotten out of hand. I know that Mr. McCauley is now involved in it. We don't need so many people reviewing it all. We need our attorney to review. And the things that, I've got this written down, district contacts, contracts, bids, bid process, and district fund purchasing, they should go through the district purchasing. But not, it, it seems to me it's not getting handled right. So I'd like to ask, and you know more about this than I do. I mean, I was taking notes very quickly, so I probably missed half of what was actually said. But Dr. Legutko and Mr. Daggett, I'd like you to bring back something to the board, some kind of actionable item, if necessary, as to who's going to handle what. And let's get this process streamlined so that, you know, internal accounts and, and you know, school contracts you know, a bounce house. That really needs to go through you, Mr. Daggett, for the legalities of if somebody, you know, gets hurt or whatever. And um, we need to make sure that they're getting done in a quick, a quick manner. So I'm asking both of you, again, I apologize for no advance notice on this request, but this needs to be addressed. So Mr. Mr. Davis, I'm hoping that you will follow up with that and um, find out who should handle what and, you know, Take care of it for us, please. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Condon, come on. Now, nobody snapped at her when she did something with no notice. Hey. <laughs> well, I learned hey. from you to apologize. Ms. Carrick, I, don't, I don't, to, I, I'm going to address it when it comes my turn. <laughs> um, so our champion of change, it was nice that he was mentioned tonight. <laughs> um, we asked a number of months ago for a district calendar of events, and you can find it on our website now, and I appreciate that. So I want to say thank you. So my question is, what will it take? to have people add stuff on there. And I don't know if the rest of you board members have felt this way, but this month we're getting all kinds of emails with, the, you know, this is coming. And we have the, the main things are on there. You know, the all county elementary chorus is on there and the science fairs on there and all. But then schools will have events and sometimes they conflict each other. And I know they can't with 41 schools, you can't always have that be. But if, if that is a user friendly where somebody can add something that it doesn't take one person's job. I know I'm not trying to be cumbersome. He's saying yes. Yeah. So that is a good, so that would be helpful. 
Yes, ma'am, through the chair. And uh, one thing we want to do is make sure we protect all district initiatives and events that we have. Um, there, then we can figure out another platform to add if there's additional school listings of activities that we can do add on there. Okay. We don't want – what we don't want is um, – we want to. I'm not saying one person should hub it all, but one person's got to navigate through it, everything, so it doesn't get all you know discombobulated. And we're we got so many things happen on one date, so there's got to be a, a kind of a system and processes for it to take place. But we can look and see if we can try to add some some school events to it, so you can have. It. Is that what you asked for? School events, because all the district events should be uploaded and ready to go. And I know I sent a calendar uh, email with all the uh, upcoming events in the next month and a half. But if there's anything additional you want, just let us know. I mean, I, we, you know, like, I don't necessarily need to know when every elementary grade level is doing their water day. Right. But, you know, when they do their play yeah. or, you know, the, the Christmas events, we, we, I didn't know about some of them. Sure. And There's just so much going on. Yeah, there, is. there is a lot with 40, you know, with a lot of many schools, schools. Got a lot of stuff. And, I, and, and I'm not suggesting that they alter, but, you know, I, I remember the um, open house conflict. Remember this past fall when we had open house, open houses on a board meeting night, and so yeah. you know we got some. So if we can use that district calendar of events, that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> um, legislative appointments. So I I don't know if we're all going to day in the legislature in February in Tallahassee with FSBA, but um, last year. Ms. Caracas had um, our lobbyist at the time make appointments for us, and we don't have a lobbyist this year, and I didn't know if we're going to make them together uh, or what we're doing as a group. Can I say something? Normally, our legislative delegate, which would be Ms. Bola, would make them okay. for us, but if you're not comfortable doing that, I'd be happy to do it, so you let me know. We can work together on it. Talk together mm -hmm. about it. Okay. Wait, the legislative delegate, the FSBA legislative liaison? All right, that's going to be Miss Betsy. I've got the sheet here. Y'all hadn't gotten to me yet. Okay. That changes in June. It, 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 it was switched yeah, because well, right now it's Miss Bola because Betsy's the chair of that committee or vice, vice chair. chair. Um, so it had been FSBA Ms. Carmen. will switch that in June. So okay. you mean that for June? That will change in June. Right. Okay. Right. And then we'll you'll do. It then. then you're doing it in June. We'll have to vote on it, but yeah, you can propose yeah. that. Well, I've got the committee assignments. Okay, y'all, you girls, just you ladies can just work it out. So you're going to work with Miss. I'll Carlos help. Yeah. I'll okay. Help. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So then we don't have any, comp just you know. Yeah. Let me ask: Are all f all board members going to legislative days? Everybody. Okay. And then my last um, request. And I'm not trying to poke, but I wanted us You are going to poke. I, I can feel it coming. A little bit. What I would like for us to consider on the February agenda um, is a unique situation for Clay County this year. And I'm not, I don't want to debate it tonight. I, I, I just want you to think about it between now and then, be able to do your homework. And I'd like us to consider it on the February agenda is removing ourselves as a district from the 7069 lawsuit. And here's why. Because... We, um, I emailed our legislative parties that Mr. Davis sent us to um, our senator, Rob Bradley, and I had a conversation with him at a, at a groundbreaking event in Keystone. As you all know, by because of some unfortunate situations, he is chair of appropriations. Mm -hmm. Typically, the chair of appropriations is able to fund some, find some money to fund some projects in their home areas that can be supported um, by other legislators. It's kind of the favors that come with that um, position. I did, he did not commit to anything with me, but I, um, I, I was excited to tell him we did different legislative parties than we've ever done before, that we had very specific ones the superintendent had given us that I thought had some very reasonable dollar amounts tied to them. Um, but the difficulty comes in, we're suing the legislature. So in order for him to be able to go to his colleagues and say, I want to do this for my home county, we're one of only 13 counties suing the state legislature. So I'd just like for you to consider, and it may not, there may not be any appetite on this board to reconsider that in February, but I'd like it put on the agenda in this unique situation to remove ourselves from the lawsuit um, 
because we could benefit as a district. And, and I, I don't want to debate it tonight. I'd just like us to talk about it next month if we but could. there were no promises made, huh? No, ma'am. Okay. And then my only other thing, I won't, I will be a lady. I will not bark on. Well, I see that big G around your neck. Hey, you got to be true to your alma mater. <laughs> so I will just say go dogs. Oh, look at him. Look at her. Okay. Is it my turn now? Okay. All right. The legislative days, if y'all haven't got your hotel reservation, we better do it. I haven't done mine yet. And then do we need to let you, do we need to let Miss Bush know? Is there a registration on that? Ms. Yeah, Miss Bush. Uh, you registered us all. Okay, so we're all going. Okay, all right. And then um, I talked to uh, Tina Pinkerson today uh, because she had sent us an email back the end of October that we uh, needed to select a day. We need um, for a master board. We need three more four-hour sessions so what she is asking is that we try to come up with a date and I'll call her tomorrow to give her the date but I called her today to get some suggested times that she wasn't already booked up and I would like for y'all to look she said the last week of January which is the 29th through February the 2nd that that would be a, a good week for her if we could find a day during that week it's four hours, and they said for us to please not have it at the, the uh, school board office. So I asked her, would it be all right to have it up here? And she said, sure, because we've got some of the side rooms Did here. Did she want to do in the morning? Oh. Not avail the, the 29th, I have an appointment, and then we mentor. We met well, we've got okay. that whole week, the okay. 29th, 30th, 31st, 1st, and 2nd. So if We have a school board meeting on the 1st. Right. Um, I'm good. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm good all those. I'm just not good Monday in the morning. Well, let's don't do Friday. I mean, Tuesday in the morning is that key to Keystone Stone Heights. lunch and learn lunch from and learn. 9 yeah. to 1030. Uh, what about Wednesday? Wednesday is great. Wednesday, Wednesday the 31st. Does that work? Yeah, so Hallelujah. Through the chair, I'll, I will have to. What? I had a scheduled um, right now final date with MC USA. They wanted to come down and, and launch our. Um, our our partnership with our in the, with our um, motivational coaches in our junior high school, and we were going to do um, availability to the press that day. Just okay. For, Let's go back and look at another date because we we want you there. Yes, ma'am. I okay. want to be there. How about Friday the second? Yeah, I'm there. You're okay, Miss Gill. Friday the second. Are you Groundhog Day. Well, we'll look for a groundhog. Good. You good? All right. Friday the second, we're going to do master board, and I'll call her tomorrow. I would assume that it would be. It's four hours, so I'm assuming it will be, you know. I have a request. I, Could we um, do that in the afternoon instead of the morning? Friday, Friday? afternoon? Mm -hmm. I know Friday afternoons are terrible, but I have a mentoring obligation on Friday morning. What Wait. time is your in From 1030 till 1130. Ooh. I know. It's right in the middle of the morning. Wait a minute. What half of the day on the 31st? Well, we could do it from, say, 1 to 5. On the 31st? All right, we'll go back. Okay. All right, I'll, try to, I'll ask her if 1 to 5 is available, and you won't, you'll be available afternoon. Okay. And we said here at Fleming Island High? Uh, we'll meet here, and there's some of these. Do we need to? I can't see Miss Bush. Miss Bush, do we need to... Um, Make sure that one of these rooms. It, we don't need a this big room, but just a, one of the. Yeah. Do we need to? Is that reserved or? We have reserved. We have schedule. Okay. Can you make sure that we've got a place to meet somewhere around here? Okay. All right. I'm on. I'll call her back and see if one to five will work for her on Wednesday, the thirty first. Well, that was recent. And then after that, uh, we'll do it. Uh, she's just doing it one at a time we've got till may the first to finish up so we uh, will probably need to set one for february and march in february march and april we're going to need two more four-hour sessions and they'll be here so we don't have to travel okay now let's see got that 
legislative days. Um, I finally got the uh, committee assignments and the graduations, and I'm going to give this to Karen, and she'll be emailing you this. If there's a problem, just holler. We'll work a bit, work it out. Okay. And the last thing is, is last Monday night there were two exciting ball games. There were. Georgia and Oklahoma was just a nail biter. I, I was pulling for Georgia. I really was. I wanted it to be SEC. And then when when Bama and Clemson came on, oh my gosh, I just can't tell you how excited I was. So now, Bama and Georgia next Monday night, 8:30, I believe. Uh, we'll see. They both want it really bad. Anything can happen. But I have to say, roll tide. Okay. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.